All right, guys, today I'm gonna to show you how I manage my money, taking it behind the scenes of my entire portfolio and share with you how I think about it, what type of asset classes I'm currently invested in, what are some of the really good deals that I made a lot of money from, and what are some of the really bad deals that I lost a lot of, a lot of money from. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Uh, what are some of the lessons that I learned along the way, and what are some things I would have done differently if I had known what I know today? All right, so I think this is gonna be super value-driven. Make sure you guys watch the entire video. So the first thing is I got majority of my wealth through my exit for my e-commerce business called Sadara Skincare. I sold that for multiple millions of dollars back in December 2020, got paid, I think, early uh, 2021. And when you have so much cash in the account, the question becomes, what do I do with it? Well, you can spend it all. You can invest it. Uh, if you're going to invest it, where do you invest it? There are so many possibilities now, right? So I want to share with you kind of what I did. Now, I'm not saying I've done the best job. In fact, far from it. But I've done a decent job, I think. And more importantly, these are the lessons that I learned along the way that I think is the most valuable part. All right. So the first thing I like to say is you can see this pie chart right here is again, I'm, guys, I'm not going to show you my exact numbers because I'm not that transparent. I don't want to see you. How, I don't want to tell you how much I have in my checking account, but I'll show you percentages. All right. So um, the first thing is real estate. All right. So you can see that we have 41.4% of our entire net worth tied up to real estate. And I'll go over kind of I'll go in depth about what type of these real estates are. We got uh, about 14% in stocks. Uh, we got 3% for my wife's new company. I got 7% in GIC. So that's like a treasury bill in the States. 6.1% in money market. Um, my new business venture that I'm starting up here as well. I got 11% in cash, 7.3% in crypto, and then 5% in life insurance and 4.6% in other investments. So these are just like startups and private equity and stuff like that. So over here, I basically keep track of all my cash, okay? Um, I wanna know how much cash I have at a certain point, obviously. And on the bottom, I wanna also know what my liquid asset is. So there's a difference between liquid asset and non-liquid asset. Liquid asset is like cash, it's like stocks, it's like, um, um, uh, what else is liquid? Um, yeah, anyways, you know, uh, the crypto, for example. So I wanna know how much liquid asset I have because if you have all your cash tied up in non-liquid assets, so for example, a house, it's gonna take a little while. You can't just sell the house tomorrow. Well, I guess technically you can, but it's non-liquid. Um, it's important to know that number, right? Just just in case that if like things go down tomorrow, I know I have this much money for me to actually be able to take advantage of a good deal or whatever it might be. You don't want all your money to be tied up in non-liquid asset because then you can never touch it. Um, you want some to definitely be liquid, okay? So that's what I do. Uh, this tab right here, I have like a monthly set, uh, summary. So the monthly summary is basically like, for example, my rental income uh, is up here month by month. These are all the money that I'm making for my rental income. Then I have my business income. Um, then over here, I have all my personal expenses. So my mortgage payment, my credit card. And then on the very bottom, I have an overall understanding of like, all right, um, how much money overall did I make this month or overall did I lose this month, right? So obviously that number is quite important. Um, then down here, I basically just have all my, um, uh, you know, uh, my companies. Uh, I have a lot of rental properties through my companies. So for each of the rental, rental property that I have, I wanna know what is the net income, what is the monthly cash flow uh, of each of these properties, right? Um, so every single month, this is filled out so that I know which properties are actually making money and which companies are uh, which ones are losing money. Um, so here are some of the U.S. real estate properties that I own. Uh, a lot of them pays either a monthly distribution or a quarterly distribution. Some are yearly distribution. I'll talk a little bit more about these in a bit, uh, but I keep track of that as well. Basically, any money that's coming in and going out. Okay. 
All right, so why don't we go over this spreadsheet? This spreadsheet is basically where all the data is. Um, it's basically, yeah, this spreadsheet is basically where all the data is, okay? So every single time I make a investment, every single time I make an investment, I put the date here, I put the where the money's coming from, I, uh, I, I put is this what type of investment this is, uh, is this a liquidable asset or not liquidable asset, then I put a quick description just to let myself know what this investment was about. Then uh, as an investment, you want to know the book value and so the market value. The book value is essentially what you invested in and the market value is essentially how much it is today. So if you invested in a stock for a dollar, that's the book value. Then if the market value today is $5, then the market value is $5. And I do that, I try to do that for all every single investment. Obviously some investments, uh, you can't know, you don't really know the market value. So later I'll kind of share with you guys. Yeah. All these different investments, I guess. I, anyways, let me, let me backtrack. All right. So let me kind of explain to you what my philosophy is. If we were to go back to the very first, um, you know, this pie chart, what I really wanted to do when I sold the business is I wanted to have like, I wanted to have like. I can't quite remember, but it was like 30% in stocks, 30% in real estate, 30% in cash, and then 10% in crypto. I think that's what I wanted my entire portfolios like, okay? And there's another very important term called uh, uh, cost averaging, right? You don't want to, for example, if you want to buy a stock, let's say if you have $100,000 to buy a stock, you don't want to just buy that entire stock on day one. What you want to do is you want a dollar cost average. So you want to do like $10,000 a month one, then another $10,000 a month two, then another $10,000 a month three. So you want to layer it in. And that's kind of what we did, right? So obviously, um, now that this chart you can see is not like 30%, 30%, 30%, 10%. Um, for example, stocks is supposed to be 30%, but it's only a 13%. Real estate is supposed to be 30%, but it's 41.4%. Um, Crypto is supposed to be 10%, 7.3%. That's pretty correct. And then 30% of cash now is only 11%. So you're always trying to balance things. By the way, there's a really good book called uh, by Tony Robbins, Money Master of the Game. I highly recommend every single person to read that book. Uh, he interviews like, I don't know, 50 billionaires or something and asks them how they manage their money. So this is one of the things that I learned from Tony Robbins, which was um, diversification. Now, having said that, guys, I also want to say another thing is I know some very successful people that do not diversify. So I know someone, for example, that um, the hedge fund owner that I'm invested with, 100% of his funds or like 90% of his funds is through his hedge fund because he's like, hey, like I'm very good at what I do. Why would I invest in anything else? So he doesn't really invest in real estate. He doesn't really invest in other things. Like he told me that everything he does is through hedge fund. So his chart will look very, very different. So I don't think there's like necessarily the right way or the wrong way. I think it all depends on like your risk tolerance. It depends on your goals and it depends on kind of your philosophy. And for me, to be honest with you, at this stage of my life, I'm not here to try to generate more wealth through my investments. If anything, I this is a lesson I learned, right? I want to actually preserve my wealth. I want to, let's say if I have like $10 million, my goal is not to turn that 10 million into 20 million the next year by investing in a bunch of startups and crypto and stuff like that. My goal is actually keep that 10 million and maybe even just earn a 5% interest. And that's essentially $500,000 a year in passive income. That's more than enough for me. Okay. That's more than enough for me. So, but that's a lesson I learned the hard way because at the very beginning, I didn't identify my goal. I felt like I just invested in everything. Whenever there's a deal, I'm like, oh wow, I can get a, I can, I can, you know, get my hands in this deal. Oh, yeah, why not? Like, let's do it. Uh, whereas I really, you know, looking back, I would have told myself, like, hey, put something, put your money into something extremely, extremely safe. And the goal of the investment is not to, is not as much as making money, but is it's 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 not losing money while earning a very very small upside. Now, having said that, I know some of my friends who, you know, um, they want to actually get to maybe from a million to ten million, 
right? And how you do that is going to be completely different than what I just said. They're going to have to invest in high risk assets. They're going to have to invest in like crypto or startups and whatever, because those things can have a way bigger upside, but then the risk is also a lot bigger. For me, I'm just not in a stage of my life right now where I want to take a lot of risk. That's all, right? There's no right or wrong. All depends on what your goals are, all right? So I want to kind of take you now behind um, my investment, in the, all the investments that I made. I'm not going to line by line because that's like going to be a five-hour video, but I'm going to kind of bucket everything, okay? So I'm just going to kind of take a look at this. All right, so uh, crypto is crypto. We invested uh at a very, very good time. Um, and we, yeah, uh, that was pretty awesome. All right. So, uh, we bought like Rune, we bought, uh, Solana, we bought Ether, we bought Bitcoin all back in like this, like 2020. So if you look at back at the chart, there was a massive bull run and we got, yeah, that was like awesome. And we sold a lot at the peak as well. So, uh, greatly, greatly timed. And at the, actually at the recording of this video, November 22nd, there's been a pretty big bull run in the crypto. So over the past month, we actually made like six figures in crypto. Um, so that's pretty awesome. All right, so um, so that's liquid, right? And we also made some. So uh, we also made some uh, investment in startups. So startups are essentially just like if you think about it. Uh, I invested in a bunch of like consumer product space. So there are some that are drinks. There are some that are potato chips. There are some that are supplements. So you can think of that. And I got through, I, I invested in these deals because I got introduced to them by a friend of mine who's very, very well connected. He's always raising money for these startup companies. And he just asked me if I want to invest. Now, to be honest with you, okay, to be 100% honest with you. So the first thing is this. I invested a very, very small amount. Okay, very small amount, um, which I'm very, very thankful for because to be 100% honest with you, startups probably have the most amount of risk out of all the asset classes. Uh, definitely, you know, up there. And the reality is that 90 plus percent of these startups are going to fail. Okay, and that's just kind of how business is. So when you're taking a big, when you're uh, getting an opportunity to actually invest in these things, for me, I was like, yo, I would just put like, a little teeny tiny bit. Uh, if they hit, great. Uh, if they don't hit, I won't lose, you know, sleep over it. Uh, but however, I did invest in a few startups that are already doing tens of millions of dollars. They are profitable and they are looking to raise money to get into like places like Whole Foods and like, um, like Costco and stuff like that. That I'm down to put more money in because really, the metric that I'm looking at here is your EBITDA, okay, which is your net profit. If you have like, if you're already making money, that's great. But if you're not making money, uh, that's very, very risky, right? A lot of these startups, they raise ideas based on the thesis and they're like, hey, we don't have any users yet, we don't have any customers yet, but we think that this is the case. Those are always very risky because a lot of times you have to pivot. A lot of times you think that customer A is going to be buying a product and then ended up being customer B. So, um, so I took some bigger swings on some startups that are positive EBITDA that are established and I believe in the operators. So for those, you know, I put like 50 grand in, uh, for the smaller startups, I put like, you know, five grand in, uh, let's just say. So, um, yeah, so that's that, um, some other ones, you know, uh, there's even one company, like a startup, I put over a hundred thousand dollars in and they've done really, really well. Um, so I'm just waiting. So how do you get paid back? Okay. This is a good question. So how do you get paid back for your money? Obviously you want to make a return. So you can get paid back two ways. All right. Number one is if the startup gets acquired, right? If the startup gets acquired, um, that's awesome. Uh, you always want to, you know, that that's that's a great payday. All the shareholders gets paid. So you want that event to happen. Um, and then number two is if they pay you dividends. So if, let's say the startup is making so much money every single year, they don't need to keep like $10 million in their cash account. A lot of them will pay dividends back to the shareholder. That's how essentially you can get paid back as well. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So some other investments I made, let's say, um, okay, well, let's just say like real estate. All right. So I've invested in a bunch of real estate. You can see that 41% of my uh, portfolio is real estate. Now, 
Real estate, I can kind of put everything into a few buckets. The very first real estate deal that I invested in, which I kind of regret now, I put like a quarter million dollars in and I still haven't seen any money coming back yet, is essentially this like pre-construction short-term rental idea. This guy, um, basically, he uh, he's pretty big into the short-term rental space and he said, hey, I'm going to create this like, you know, um, this club, this like, I don't know, this, this, uh, I don't know how to describe it. This resort, you can call it. Okay. When I create this resort, it's going to be in the U S and it's going to attract these, you know, kite surfers that's going to come here. And, um, and I was like, wow, that looks great. Right? Like he owns the land, he owns the houses and then COVID hit, right? I made this investment July 31st, 2021. Um, but yeah, COVID hit, and then also I, I'm not sure if you remember, but like the lumber prices went sky high, the labor prices went sky high. So uh, that didn't really turn out too well, and I still haven't gotten paid from that yet because I don't think the project is done yet. And um, yeah, I mean the project is now done, so they're not like paying dividends, right? So to be honest, the mistake that I made there was that. I shouldn't have invested in a pre-construction. I shouldn't have invested in a deal where it's already exist and um, they're already paying cash flow. They're already paying dividends because in that way, my money I give to them and the next month I get back a little bit. I get back a little bit. I get back a little bit, okay? So yeah, I would never really invest in any sort of pre-construction build um, again, I don't think. Then I invested some that are just, you know, normal properties, right? You got your, like, uh, I have condos, I have townhouses, I have this and that. So those things, to be honest with you, they're not like crazy money makers. Um, the monthly cash flow that I get from them are a couple hundred bucks a month, okay? They're, but I guess the thing about like Vancouver real estate as well as BC real estate is the appreciation. So for example, I bought a townhouse in a city called Kelowna for like $500,000, three bedroom, two bathroom. And uh, that has gone up to like $650,000. So I built $150,000 worth of equity. It's gone up that much over the past few years. Uh, so that's pretty cool, right? Um, yeah, so that's that. I bought you know some townhouses, um, apartments, condos, uh, stuff like that. All right, so the other thing that I invested in with real estate is funds. So these are essentially multifamily funds, okay? Multifamily funds, what they are, they are essentially a group of people. They are looking to purchase a uh, complex, usually, maybe 100 doors, 200 doors, 300 doors, whatever they might be. And then what they're looking to do is they're looking to uh, um, acquire the asset, they're looking to actually improve the value. So for example, if every single tenant in this complex is paying $100 a month in rent, their goal is to increase it to $200 a month in rent. So there is a delta of $100, right? So that extra $100, when they actually go sell this entire complex to someone else, that asset is worth so much more. It's worth so much more. So before, maybe they bought this place for $7 million, um, but now they can sell for like $14 million, just as an example, right? Arbitrary number. So that's the that's the play. What they do is they acquire a complex, they, they put lipsticks on it, they fix things up, they increase the rent um, ethically, okay? And then they don't just like, you know, hold a gun to people's head, be like, increase the rent or get, get out. No, it's not like that, right? So... Uh, and then they hold it for three to five years. Usually they refinance with the bank so that the original investors get all their money back. And then they also pay monthly or quarterly or yearly distribution because these places are making money, right? They're collecting rental income. Then in three to five years, they're hoping to have an exit event as well. They're hoping to stabilize the net income and then sell it to a bigger like REIT or whatever it might be. So this is a very interesting model because you are essentially paying someone else for the work, right? You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. It's hundred percent off. Um, so I've invested in a few of these deals. A few of them turned out pretty bad actually. Um, but a few of them have turned out pretty good. Um, so I think it all comes down to the operator. Like who's the group that's running it, right? Um, if the group is running it are capable, they're great operators. They have a good track record. They're not greedy. They are, um, 
yeah, like they're they're good at what they do, um, and they can forecast. See, like one thing is I made these investments back in 2021 when the um, when the what is it called the uh, um, mortgage rates are like what two percent. Now they're like seven percent. So a lot of these guys are getting killed right now. They're absolutely hurting, right? Because they didn't forecast in that. You know, I don't I don't really blame them, but they didn't forecast in that sudden increase in uh in interest and interest payments are absolutely killing them, right? But then there are still some groups that mitigated the risk. There are some groups that bought something called rate cap. Um, it's essentially like an insurance type of vehicle. So you know, I invest in a bunch of these deals in the same time. Some groups are still paying me. Some groups stop paying me. And some groups are saying, hey, like we lost 80% of your money. So I think what I learned is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on like multifamily kind of these real estate funds, but you got to find a good group to invest your money in. If you don't, um, yeah. And by the way, how do I hear about these groups? Honestly, guys, like just through with friends, right? Like uh, I guess the wealthier you get, the more f wealthy friends you have, and then money just kind of like goes in circles. And then, yeah, I invested in a pre-construction townhouse project uh, in Vancouver. I'm pretty bullish in Vancouver real estate, guys. Um, like <sighs> Vancouver real estate is just so like, I don't even know the word for it, to be honest with you. But like, man, they, it just doesn't go down, it seems like. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, like, if it was 2008 or 2020 or whatever. There's just so much foreign money coming into Vancouver. And Vancouver real estate, I mean, they don't really build too many places, to be honest, which, you know, is, I don't think is a good thing. But uh, the inventory level is quite low, I think. But it's always a, like, seller's market. So uh, I, invest, I invested in a pre construction town home. I put like 300 grand in that. Um, but, um, yeah, hopefully that place completes soon and, um, we'll get, you know, some money back plus, uh, plus, plus, you know, uh, some left, make some money there. Um, but yeah, obviously the, uh, in again, guys, over the past few years, like this interest rate thing has not been good for people. All right. It has not been good for any business, especially businesses that have lending that loan money against like with the banks is not good so uh, also with the construction of COVID this and COVID that like man like real estate was not good over the past few years so that's that the best investment that i made over the past few years has actually been a little cabin on Vancouver island that cabin i bought for like eight hundred and eighty thousand. i put quarter million dollars down and that has generated about a hundred ten thousand dollars in revenue every single year. And um, out of that, you know, minus the mortgage payments, minus that, like, it's pretty darn good. All right. That's pretty darn good return on investment. And we put it as a short term rental. And um, it just gives us cash flow. It's great cash flow. Every single month, we get a check. Uh, next year, we'll be managing ourselves. So we get a check after every single gets checkout. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, other than that, I also invested in some private equity funds. Um, the private equity funds, they invest in a bunch of deals. Like, honestly, these guys are, they are not really, they invest in real estate. They invest in, uh, cannabis stocks. They invest in this, they invest in that. Like, they invest in everything. Um, they've done okay, I guess. They've done okay. They've been paying quarterly, uh, dividends and these how these work guys is that there's like a 220 model right so basically what they do is they take a two percent asset management fee so what that means is like let's say that uh they are handling a million dollars so well they take two percent of that right away so that's 20 g's right away and that's keeping the lights on and then when they make money okay when they make money 80 percent goes back to the investors and 20 percent go to them all right so that's like the 220 model uh, and then there's something called like pref share, 8%. So the first 8% goes back to the investors and stuff like that. But that's generally how it works. They're all right. Uh, they're doing decent. Uh, penny stocks. Oh my God. Penny stocks. Uh, the other day I went into my, uh, I went into my uh, penny stocks account and I, uh, yeah, I put 130 grand in there and now there's 10 grand left. So <laughs> I lost 120 grand there. Um, these penny stocks, this is my thoughts, okay? So with penny stocks, again, it, all, it also depends on the group that the guys you're playing with, right? Some are greasy, some are not. Um, some, the reality of penny stocks is this. It's very, very risky. Same as 
uh, crypto, same as um, uh, startups, okay? Because a lot of these penny stocks, a lot of them, they are, they're not making money. Like they are, they have revenue and then they're losing so much money every single year, okay? And I think a lot of people over the past few years of investing, like they're, they became quite okay with that. It's like a business that's doing $30 million a year, um, losing 10 million. They're like, oh, that's fine. But it's like, man, like a business is there to make money. It's not supposed to lose money. Well, oh, no, no, it's for growth. It's for growth. Like we're reinvesting everything into this. That that's fine, right? They're going. That's that's growth. But with that comes a lot of risk because you see how many startups have gone under because they can't raise any more money in this current environment. So I think step one, like every single business, their goal is to make money, to so make profit. Because um, it's not because that's just the end of it. So a lot of these penny stocks, what I found later on is that they're not making any money. They're losing so much money, right? And to be honest with all of you, like penny stocks is a very interesting game. I know a lot of guys in finance, right? Some of my good friends are in finance and the stories they tell me, it's very much like, it's, I'm sure you guys have heard of these like pump and dumps, right? Like basically the founders and the group, they're raising money. They have no intention to actually make this business even work. If it works, great. But if it doesn't work, we're just going to dump out the stock. So um, that's really, really bad. All right. Like it's not a good way to do business. So for me, um, I don't want to invest in any more penny. And guys, it's not just penny stocks. Actually, I lost a lot of money in stocks as well. Like stocks have absolutely killed me. Okay. Uh, especially during the run up when everybody was investing in stocks, I got absolutely destroyed. And what I realized afterwards is this. I am not a good stock picker. I am not a good company picker. I am not a good investor from that perspective because you have to understand if you're if you're buying stocks, okay? Buying stocks is a very like a zero sum game, meaning every single time you sell, someone needs to buy. Every single time you buy, someone needs to sell. So what that means is that in order for you to make money, someone has to lose money in a way, okay? It's a non-zero sum game. So if you're buying stocks against these hedge funds with quants and people graduate from MIT and computer this, that, like with charts and software and this and that, there's no way you're going to beat them. Okay. Absolutely no way. So, um, what I realized is also with stocks is that there's a lot of emotion involved. Like I would buy a stock and it goes up like 10% one day. I'm like, Oh my gosh, should I sell? Should I sell? And it like, it drives me crazy. I can't sleep at night. Like, uh, I ch check the chart all day. Like it's really annoying. It distracts me from doing my businesses. And I just don't like it anymore. All right. So, um, so yeah, that's that, I guess. Um, so from day, from now on, I don't invest in any stocks. All right. I don't invest in any stocks myself. I don't invest in penny stocks. I don't invest in any of that because I do not need to take the high risk. Okay. Now I know a lot. I'm not saying no one needs to invest in penny stocks. I'm saying I don't need to invest in penny stocks. It's not for me. I know a lot of people have done well in it. They're looking for the 10 baggers. Hey, good for them. But I'm not, I'm not doing that myself. All right. So, um, I invested in a hedge fund as well. They've been doing really well. My money is locked up for three years with them. So, um, I haven't got my money back yet because it's been less than three years. Uh, but having said that, I get reports. Uh, uh, I became good friends with the owner. Um, like he was at my wedding. I have, you know, seven figures with them and I, re they invest in stocks and I really like his investment thesis, right? Um, he looks for companies that have been crushed, that got destroyed, that went all the way down. And he's like, hey, how much is this company worth? Because their market cap says 10 million, but maybe they are worth 50 million. And then he will do his assessment and then buy in. And then hopefully that the, the market always balances itself out, right? The market is also like equilibrium. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this, but it always finds equilibrium. And that's the beautiful thing about the free market uh, is supply and demand. So it always even itself out. So he's hoping that picking up he's trying to pick up stocks that are undervalued and hopefully that he noticed that before the rest of the market notices. And then, um, yeah, he's done really, really well, but more importantly, it's more about the way he thinks like his pr investment principles. I think that is something I really, really admire. And I've learned a lot from him. Um, other than that right now, I just been putting a lot of my money into money markets. I see, I think I have like yeah, like seven figures at this point um, in those things. So, I mean, look, like, let's say I have a million dollars in those things, right? I have a million dollars in GIC. That gets me 5% every single year. 
that's 50 G's a year. Like if I have $10 million, right? I mean, guys, that's like really, really good. And it's like pretty much risk-free. So, um, yeah, I mean, going forward, I really want to change up my investment principles. I want to invest in safer things that gets me five to seven to 10% yield. And I'm good. Like I'm happy. I don't need to go for, again, these like crazy returns and stuff like that. Just for me. Okay. Just for me, um, for others, I don't know, but you can do whatever you want with my money. Like, you know, I, I don't really, I don't really care what you do with your money. So, um, anyways, I hope this has been helpful guys. Um, taking you kind of behind the scenes of all of my investments, the lesson I learned. Um, and, um, yeah. And Hey, who knows? Maybe a few years later, I'll do another video. I'll be like, guys, everything I said in this video is wrong. Like I need to actually be doing, you know, this, this, this instead. So anyways, hopefully you guys enjoy this video. Let me know how you like it. Click the thumbs up button. And if you're listening on podcast, leave me a comment or review or whatever you got to do. Okay. All right, guys. Talk to y'all soon. Ciao.